It is now 5.30 p.m. and I now call to order the Grand Island Public Schools Board of Education meeting. This is the March 14, 2024 meeting. Notice of this meeting has been advertised in the Grand Island Independent, which is the district's designated method of giving notice of these meetings. We want those in attendance to know that copies of the Open Meetings Act are available at the entrance to the boardroom. If anyone in attendance is interested in addressing our board, you are welcome to do so. We simply request that you complete the appropriate form and turn it into us so that you may be recognized during the request to address the board part of our meeting. If you have not already completed the form, please see the staff person outside the entrance to this room. Public comment is welcome. We do ask that no signs be brought into the boardroom. Mrs. Dibbert, would you please call the roll? Mr. McFarland. Present. Mr. Hawley. Here. Mr. Garcia Mendez. Present. Mrs. Albers. Here. Mr. Sykes. Here. Ms. Moblin has given prior notice that she's unable to attend and her absence is accepted. Mr. Helensky. Here. Mrs. Jer Wilson. Sorry. <laughs> Mrs. Jurgens has um, also gave uh, prior con um, absence, and her absence is accepted. Thank you, Mrs. Dibbert. The first item on the agenda tonight is a consent agenda. The consent agenda is to be approved as follows items number 3.1 through 3.6. This is a consent agenda as published. Would anyone like to remove any items or add any items to the consent agenda? Seeing none, d does anyone have a potential conflict of interest on agenda item number 3.3? .3? If so, please state the check number you will be abstaining from voting on. Seeing none, I would at th this time entertain a, a <coughs> excuse me, uh, <coughs> excuse me, can't talk. Uh, a motion to approve the consent agenda as submitted. I recommend a motion to approve the consent agenda as submitted. Second. Second by Ms. Albers. Discussion? Seeing none, I'll may you proceed to vote. Motion passes. Item number four, request to address the board. We do not have anyone to request to address the board this evening, so we'll move on to item number five, information items. <laughs> item number 5.1, monthly update of the board and community on the major items discussed and under consideration by the Grand Island Public Schools Education Foundation. Ms. Carrie Hooker Leap. Thank you. Well, good evening. I've just got so many exciting things to talk about, so I'm gonna do this pretty quickly, not taking up a lot of time. Hopefully no hook comes out and I get pulled off. Um, I just wanted, first off, I wanted to talk a little bit about Legends and Legacies, and several of you were at the um, event we held on Tuesday. We started off the morning unveiling our new Hall of Honor at Grand Island Senior High. If you haven't made it over to see it, please do. It's this glorious wall that shows our 74 now inductees with a kiosk in the middle that you can touch and see the full biography of each uh, member. Then we had the evening event, and that was a banquet. We honored not just the three Hall of Honor inductees, that was Steve Hornaday, um, George Ayub and Dr. Thomas Meadle, but we also honored three legendary educators, and that was Kermit McHugh, Yvette Inglehop, and Don Vanderham. So it was a really, it, I, I felt like it was a wonderful event, and if you weren't there, Mr. McFarland did the invocation, he did a glorious job. So that was one of the highlights of our week, and then today we did scholarships, but I'm gonna kind of give you a little bit of a detail about our scholarships as we kicked it off. Um, we had 204 out of our class of seniors submit scholarships. Um, that is, sorry, 204 scholarships um, submitted, 152 were from GISH. The remainder were from outside of GISH. That's 27% of our class, which is actually, it sounds low, but that's an increase from last year. That was 25% uh, last year. We gathered 93 reviewers and several of you review to look over the scholarship because it is a blind process. This year, we have the potential of offering $682,668. 
um, that's broke down in our academic aristocrat scholarships at 65,160 and our regular scholarships at 617,508, a total of 193 scholarships. Now, another note, we had 86 students out of the class that actually qualified for our academic aristocrat program. So that is a 27% increase over last year. Last year we had 62, excuse me, 62. So I, again, it's a, such a huge credit to GIPS. Um, we are today offered two scholarships. That was the Frith scholarships. Those are $40,000 scholarships that was offered to Anna Lee, who's going into education and plans on coming back to Grand Island. Super excited about that one. And Joseph, and he's going into music education, both of them going to UNL. We also offered the two Jack Martin Lucille scholarship, Martin scholarships, and they are $22,000 a piece. And those were offered to two students. They're both going to KSU. Sarah is gonna go into um, animal science, and Ellie is going into architecture. Another note, Ellie will graduate with 20 credit hours for college already. So she, she was really amazing. Um, finally, each of you received a packet from the foundation. We are kicking off our giving program again. Our staff giving program starts on March 25th. It goes through April 22nd. Last year, we raised $111,000, um, and that was through 1,454 staff members at a 93% participation. Again, another increase for us was 92% the year before. We have set a gold standard for GIPS for giving. If you go around the nation, you will see normally it's 60, 67%. So at 93%, you see that the people are giving back. Um, this, that means our staff gave in, since the induction of 2004, $1,511,000 plus, and for every dollar given, the foundation has added 2216 to those dollars for a grand total of $33,505,107,000. So, you make a difference. This year we had Doug and Cheryl Jensen. Um, they are doing our challenge, which means they give us $5,000 to match any new donations or any increased donations. Doug and Cheryl have been with GIPS in the district for 69 years of teaching. If you do not know them, they are phenomenal individuals. Doug has several um, sculptures and Cheryl still um, gives of her time through the foundation and through the schools. So those are my things that we're doing right now. Does anybody have any questions? Not? Thank you so much. Thank you much. Okay, item number 5.2, update on special education programming and GIPS, Ms. Renee Engel. Thank you guys. Guys, sorry. Board of Education, Mr. Fisher, thank you guys so much for having me tonight. And as Dalton can attest to, I've been having lots of fun with my technology this week, so I am a little bit nervous. Well, thank you board members and Mr. Fisher for having me here tonight. My name's Renee Engel and I'm the Director of Special Education. This is my 11th year um, in this position in the district, my 13th year in the district, uh, 20th year as a Special Education Administrator and 30 years in education. So tonight I'm gonna give you a, a short story about special education staff, student and services. I might, I might not. So just wanted to kick off with the special education department mission. Um, it is to support student achievement academically, socially, emotionally, so that they have access to quality educational opportunities in their least restrictive environment as they develop skills to become independent and productive individuals. And who are we? The special education department or staffing um, just wanted to share who's providing um, special education services here at GIPS. Currently, we have 85 special education teachers. These are certified positions providing services from birth to beyond 
high school. That's our 12 plus program, 18 to 21. This year, we have several unfilled positions. We have um, one at Dodge, one at Wasmer, and one at Barr, and it had several requests for additional staffing. In addition to our special education teachers, we have special education support. So um, myself and three supervisors support um, um, all of our certified and classified staff members. And then on this side, we have all of our specialists and our related services team members. Our school psychologists, speech pathologists, <coughs> occupational therapists, physical therapists, a visual <coughs> specialist, and teachers of deaf and hard of hearing, um, and positive support coaches, net consultants, they really help um, in the evaluation process, and then also help provide support, specialized support um, across all settings. So we basically have over 100 certified special education positions in Grand Island Public Schools and over 130 special education paraprofessionals to support all of our children um, across the district. And um, as far as um, resource teachers, 83 of them have their special education endorsement. 39 of them have specialized letters training. We have 12 sign language interpreters in our district serving our students. Our trend um, for more students needing sign language interpretation has really grown over the past two years. And then once again, we have over 130 um, paraprofessionals. They're all amazing and dedicated to the work that we do. And what guides our work? It's IDEA, which is the Individuals with Disability Education Act. It's a federal law um, that was put into place about 40 years ago. And basically states that it provides financial assistance to state and local agencies to provide free and appropriate educational opportunities, or FAPE, as we call it in special education, because we love acronyms. So here's one of them. I might use it repeatedly tonight, so I wanted to make sure I got that up there. And it states they're going to help provide that financial support to provide special education and related services to eligible children with disabilities. So IDA defines 13 categories of disabilities that a student can be found eligible in. And they might be eligible in more than one of these areas, okay? And you might be like, well, Renee, those disability categories ranging all the way from autism to emotional uh, disturbance um, and into speech uh, language impairments and specific learning disabilities. You might be like, that's kind of out of focus. That's with great purpose and intent because the focus is not on a disability. The focus should always be on the child, the student, the individual first. And so by not making the disability, the, keeping it in the forefront, we can truly focus on the individual. So who's eligible for special education services? Isn't that just something that anybody can get? No, it's actually um, quite prescriptive and very difficult to qualify for special education services. There's actually three prongs of eligibility for special education. First, a student has to have a diagnosed disability. And this isn't just a medical disability that a doctor can send in. This is also an educational disability, so we have to take medical documentation into consideration, and then also complete a comprehensive evaluation in the educational setting, okay? So this has to be across um, settings. Two, the diagnosis must adversely affect the child's educational performance. And last but certainly not least, um, this one's probably the most difficult one to meet. Does their child require specially designed instruction to receive FAPE um, in the educational setting? And you might be like, well, why is that one hard? Well, let me give an example. If a student is visually impaired and they were prescribed glasses and they wear them, um, they might be able to access free and appropriate education. So they would not need any additional specially designed instruction to access free and appropriate, free and appropriate educational opportunities. However, a child that might need um, equipment to enlarge all text in addition to glasses, they might have to learn how to use that specialized AAC device so they would qualify for services because they would require specially designed instruction to understand how to access um, education, okay? So what do we do in special education? Everybody thinks it's a, it's a magical place, a thing, a place. I, basically it is. We provide early intervention specially designed instruction and related services in a variety of settings um, to eligible children birth to 21, okay? And you might be going, Renee, did you say birth to 21? 
and yes, I did. Now this is looking pretty small maybe for you guys, but it's the best way to give you a big picture of what IDA, that federal law, requires of us, okay? So I'm gonna start on the left with part C and transition to part B, okay? So when we're helping explain the breadth of our services, in part C, we start with the crib. So our services go from crib to bus, part C to part B, okay? So in part C, we provide services birth to two. We provide services in a natural environment, might be at home, a caregiver setting, and everything we do is guided by state rule 52. There we provide early intervention service, notice I didn't say special education services, and we have to create an individual family plan for each and every child that qualifies. Service delivery, our service providers partner with the parents in a natural environment, and we coach and partner and help them navigate um, the disability the child's just probably been diagnosed with. We get referrals straight from the hospital, okay? Um, then, once a child gets three, we transition to our Part B. So this is from three all the way to age 21. And in three to five, we can provide that in the natural setting, or we can provide that in our own preschool program, okay? And we'll partner with, with wherever the parents see fit to place their child, because remember, preschool is not mandatory in the state of Nebraska. Okay, so we provide specialized instruction. They have to meet those three prongs. For each of these individuals, they have their own IEP, Individual Education Plan, and you might be going, well, what's the big deal? It's just a plan. Every IEP has 151 um, items on there that we have to make sure that we complete and do. So when you think of special educators doing IEPs for every child, it's a lot of paperwork, guys, okay? Um, and then once we get to age five, all the way to 21, we follow those same guidelines under Rule 51, and we write an IEP for each of those students. Um, am I missing anything? I don't think so. Um, just to talk a little bit about the evaluation process, just please know a parent must give consent for a child to be evaluated and even considered for special education. And even if they consent for services or evaluation and or services, at any time the parent can revoke those services. So a parent may choose not to have their child participate in those services. Oh, sorry, I was talking too much. Okay, so how many students do we serve? 1,838 students are eligible for special education services here in GIPS. And I started at birth and broke it down per age band. So overall, our percentage, our special ed percentage rate in Grand Island is 18%, which um, anybody would consider between 12 and about 18 to be well within normal limits. We would consider that within the average range, and we've really been working hard on our MTSS process, so we just don't default to putting kids in special education. We really are developed a quality system, and I think this number reflects that. So what is special, uh, where is special education located? And this answer might surprise you. Everywhere, okay? One thing I really want you guys to know is special education is not a location. And I think when special education first started, it was a place you sent kids and that's where they went. That's not the case. Research shows that kids really do benefit from being educated in the least restrictive environment with their peers to the greatest extent that's appropriate for them. And that's just important to know and remember, okay? Um, and it is that early intervention and specially designed instruction that we provide in the least restrictive environment. Okay, I am just going to share with you um, our special education continuum of services in Grand Island Public Schools. Big picture, okay? Um, because we have such a hearty continuum of services that you guys continue to support to make sure that we can provide individualized instruction for students. Um, it would be difficult to list them all and highlight them all. But I do want to just talk about, we start down on the left-hand side of here, um, of this continuum. We provide out-of-class supports. We partner with um, general education teachers and we really talk about the student, what barriers they have in learning, how can we remove those, what instructional strategy will help them in the classroom, and then how we can provide strategies, scaffolds, and toolkits to help them um, get the access to the education they need. 
the green in class supports, we do all those things in the classroom, the general education and or special educator. They might be in there co-teaching or doing small group station work, and paraprofessionals might be in there helping as well. Kids should be getting that core instruction, and then the yellow should be an additional layer, especially designed instruction. It's not either or. Back in the old days, you either were in core or you were in special ed. It has to be access to the core and then the more. So you get your green, the additional layers of yellow that you need, and then for some of our kids who have um, special or more significant needs, they may require a more specialized program here in Grand Island. So very special ed-like, I put some acronyms on there like CBI and Skills Academy and Workforce Prep Academy and TLP, Project Search, ALS and ISP, and those are our more um, specialized programs. Um, that are referral, totally based on data over time, and they're all transition programs. So a student's not gonna stay there forever unless that's the least restrictive environment. Once kids develop those skills and they're improving and practicing and they're ready to transition back to different levels of services, we're going to do that as well, okay? And then a few of our students still need even more specialized support, and then that's when we would seek support from an outside agency. Currently, we have only three students um, that are receiving um, special education um, services and outside agencies, okay? Okay, Ooh, that was faster than I thought. Um, so, <laughs> um, and just there at the bottom, I did just remind us that these all need to occur in the least restrictive environment and that we, we use these in a variety of ways to meet the individualized needs and no matter how hardy our continuum is, there's always gonna be a student that fits in between someplace. So that's why we annually review where we're at and what we might have to do to shift our needs to meet more students' needs, okay? Um, last but certainly not least, I wanna thank you guys for your continued support. Whenever we come and ask and share our needs um, and the growing changes of our students' um, needs, you guys have always been very supportive, so I wanna say thank you for that. Okay, any questions? Mr. Hawley. Thanks, Renee, for being here. Um, I have two questions. Yep. This may sound a little bit strange, but the increased trend in sign language, I ask it why, but that may seem obvious. But is it is it we're seeing more students maybe from other districts who are coming to Grand Island because we offer those services and they don't? Is that? Um, <coughs> yes. Okay. Um, I just I think we are right now seeing an increase um, in just hearing impairments in general, and I don't know. There, I'm sure there's a lot of medical reasons for that as well. Um, we used to be a big hub for um, deaf and hard of hearing services, and it seems like we're becoming that again. And I do think a lot of families are moving here because we do have other students with those needs, and so I do think they are seeking it out. It's like all other special education services here. I get calls almost weekly about um, my district says they can't provide these services. They sent, they told us to call you. And um, I said, well, um, under IDA, federal law, they're required to provide those, and they're giving financial assistance to do that. So go back and, and, and talk with them about that. Um, because to be honest with you guys right now, as you can see, staffing-wise, we're at capacity and beyond. Yep. So, um, yeah, I think it's both those things. Okay. Yep. And my second question, on the 12-plus services, so I think you, had, you said you have 37 students. Mm -hmm. um, is that on campus, in home, is it... Uh, students who are still living with parents or if they're on their own, what does that look like? So our 1821 program is for those students who need to stay with us a little bit longer to work on functional living skills and functional academic skills. So we have two primary locations for that, and that's our Ender House, which is located just across from Grand Island. And I think um, our, didn't one of our classes build that as a building project one year, Robin? We were talking about that. They actually built the Ender House. And so those students are there. We have students upstairs and downstairs. They're in there working on academics. They learn how to prep their take care of themselves and then they go out onto job sites and also learn to do rec and leisure activities um, and then we also have our project search partnership with St. Francis and so we're actually located um, at St. Francis and we do three rotations there Michelle Honus helps navigate that and then we do also have a few students a few of them might be medically um, still receiving homebound services we have one or two this year and then Workforce Prep Academy used to primarily be for juniors through seniors, but we've had a couple kids have stayed an extra year to gain some more vocational skills with us. Very cool. Yeah. Thank you for sharing. Yeah. Ms. Salvers. 
so in L for L, when you were presenting this, we talked a little bit about the um, bills that are. Um, oh yes. Oh, that too. Yeah. The other thing, the other question I had. Let's start with that. Okay. So, uh, so we were. Uh, one of the questions that came up is, I was curious how many ELL students were also then qualifying for um, SPED services, and you said you could kind of check that Got out. It. Yeah. I know Amanda, uh, Dr. Leibos talked last time, and 26% of our students are eligible for EL services in our district, 18% for special education, and those that are eligible for both services right now currently stands at 10.5%. That's a little higher than I thought it might be. All right. I thought 12. Yeah. Oh, so I, I, I was thinking maybe 12. Oh, okay. So 10.5 yeah. was, was really good. Okay. Yeah. Thank you for yeah. looking that up. Yeah, I appreciate no it. Um, so I, th I think it's important for us all to see where those crossover services where kids when are you think about 26 percent of our EL students yeah yes Tenth think about so that. that's still quite a bit yeah yeah, yeah. absolutely yeah. um then my other question was um just about the bills that are in the unicameral that are are really um encouraging kids to go into special ed and I was just wondering if you were watching those we've got LB 964 yes. and LB 1238 it's all the time for Mike right Delaney. yeah yeah and I am excited about that one of them specifically is about loan forgiveness mm -hmm. for students that go to college for special education and it will really help bring people I think to the special ed area I know we also talked about different things that we're doing to grow our own special educators mm -hmm. um we are, we've partnered with um, Shadron State College for Special Education, that para to teacher, and we've, we've had some teachers that are actually, we've had one come back and we have a couple that are trying to do it. They're navigating that, which is super exciting. Um, also, I've talked with CCC, this campus here in Grand Island in Columbus, and they are looking to, um, more on the classified part, in the fall, they'd like to start uh, like a certificate program for paraprofessionals. I know. So our paraprofessionals, like a high school student, maybe could take some dual credits and become MAT trained on de-escalation strategies and relationships, maybe have their CPR training done, be Title I, ready to go, and be a paraprofessional. So I think a lot of people are looking for different ways to draw people back this direction, and it's, it's really exciting. I must say we've had some success in the area of speech-language pathology, which is always a hard to fill area and we I, I know you're all gonna be stunned so I'm glad you're sitting down we honestly have hired six speech language pathologists this year yes, which is incredible um, just to put it that way now I'm saying we really do need a lot of school psychs but yeah. the forecast is we've been talking with people and we have about four individuals in the next two to three years that will be coming back mm -hmm. with hopefully their school psychology degree so. Well, and then there's also a bill that will allow you to hire school psychs through agencies. So, like, not necessarily full. I guess, as I understand it, not full time employees, but you can. We do hire that. Them. We yeah, have. You do already do that. Yeah, we do okay. that. But right. um, yeah. Okay. Yeah, and anyway. I think they're trying to encourage more people to okay. really think outside the box. Yes. And it doesn't always have to look like this or feel like no. this. Yeah. No, I agree. Well, thank you. Yeah. Mr. Garcia Mendez. Thank you. Uh, I have three questions, maybe four. Um, you were explaining how a child needs to be um, evaluated, yeah. basically. Um, can you walk me through how that happens? You bet. Yeah. So a referral could be made from a parent. It could also be made from, by a teacher. Uh, maybe they're just concerned about lack of progress academically, socially, or emotionally. Um, then a school psychologist or speech pathologist, depending on what type of referral it is, is going to sit down and call the parent and just talk, up, really learn about the concerns. They're going to create an evaluation plan. It needs to be comprehensive. Um, so we're going to give norm reference tests for more formalized tests. We're also going to be collecting data from the classroom. Uh, to see how they're doing it in the classroom. If they're in MTSS, how are they reacting to interventions? We're gonna gather all that information and see if we meet that criteria. Um, we'll bring that information back and we sit down with the MDT, another acronym, multidisciplinary team, which always includes the parent because they're a primary member there. Um, and we just talk about, hey, this is what this evaluation found. And as a team, do we agree that the student meets the three prongs of eligibility and they require specially designed instruction? At that time, if the student's found eligible, the parents can agree or disagree to receive services. Okay. Yeah. And you said that a, a parent has to give consent, right, mm -hmm. um, to do all of that. Yeah. So what does a district do if a parent is working full-time um, mm -hmm. during the day what happens? Because there's a lot of families, especially 
when you think about the the Ward C, which uh, me and Holly are both in, um, there's a lot of working parents, and I'm sure in a, a bunch of all of our yeah. uh, kind of wards. Um, but I feel like there's a lot of parents that either work during the day and then another one works at night, or they're both just like always working. But how does that work if you can't get a parent in there? Get creative. Yeah. I mean, I, to be honest, we've met people at lunch hours on breaks. We'll come early. We'll uh-huh. stay late. Um, we can do it electronically. We can do Zoom now. We can do phone calls and then mm-hmm. send it to them. So we do whatever we need to. Okay. Um, and I appreciate just, that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, we'll, we'll, no, we'll get it done if we need to. We just to gotta hear. be creative, and sometimes yeah. we just need to go to work or on a break. Sometimes that's what we do. Yeah, yeah. I appreciate that, yeah. and just um, letting all the other staff know that um, we appreciate that and the hard work that they do, um, because it is it's it's very difficult to get parents um, involved, and I'm sure it's very difficult to be a parent um, with children with all, a lot of these other needs. Um, and then my other question was, do you know what? kind of like growth and percentage it's been overall with the trend of increase of special education in the district? In our district, actually, yeah. since I started 11 years ago, like we were at about 22%. So we okay. are actually at 18 now, which is really good. Uh-huh. And I would have to say, maybe Dr. Liebos and I used to say, I would say our percentage of, well, I wouldn't say that. I would say our percentage of EL to SPED was a lot different now. I think we're doing a lot better job of teasing out, is this a language difference or a learning language, or is it a language disorder? So I just think we're getting more savvy at that over time. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. Our Sounds trends great. in general, I do see an increase in deaf or hard of hearing. There's also been a significant increase in autism in mm-hmm. some basic speech, language, and social concerns. Okay. Yep. That's good to know. Thank yeah. you so much. That's it. Okay. Nice presentation, Ms. Engel. Thank you very much for your knowledge of the subject. Thank Thank you. you. Appreciate it. Fun fact. Mrs. Engel's dad was my junior high football coach. (laughs) (laughs) It's real. (laughs) And he really appreciated it. Thank you guys so much. Item number 5.3, EEL positions, Dr. Carrie Kohler. Hello, I'm dragging Dr. Levas up here with me. So we are up asking for some EL positions tonight. Um, We have a bilingual and a teacher needed at senior high and a bilingual para and a teacher needed at Stolly Park, both locations right now. Um, She presented last month and had numbers and I just wanted her to come back tonight and refresh our memory on some of those pieces. All right, since the last time I was here, we've we've seen 70 new students through our Welcome Center. So I was here just last month. (laughs) Yeah. Um, So I'll start with Stolly Park with two five newcomers. Um, We have five teachers currently, um, and they're ranging anywhere from 23 to 26 students in a classroom. By March 20th, we'll have a total of 123 students. We have transitioned as many students um, that possible back to their home schools at trimester. So everybody who's currently in our 2-5 newcomer program have arrived, um, have recently arrived to Grand Island. Um, So that additional teacher um, definitely will help uh, support uh, the teachers and the paras um, at uh, Stolly Park. I don't want to put any numbers out there because I I may jinx ourselves, but we could have another 12 to 15 students enroll in 2-5 newcomers before the end of the school year. Uh, at the high school level, 9-12 newcomers, by March 20th, we'll have 150 students in our um, 9-12 newcomer program. We currently have six teachers. One is working with our students that are 19 and older. Um, that has been super successful. We've only had one student move. We've added another student um, who is working um, full-time is still working full-time and is um, enrolled in our program and is, uh, has been able to uh, fit in um, great with that group. So we're sitting at 11 there. But between the other five classrooms, three of them are already at 30 students apiece. And they use some criteria with that group one through five um, based on students' proficiency levels, what their educational experience has been. Um, and so we really want to keep that criteria of grouping students um, and getting them the support that they need. 
Uh, based on previous year numbers at the high school, I could see another 15 to 20 students enroll um, before the end of the school year. Um, so those are the two requests. I'm sure you'll have questions about middle school. Right now, Bar Middle School has 72 newcomers with three teachers. Walnut has 69 newcomers with three teachers. Um, and then Westridge, if you remember I presented, we uh, started serving newcomers at Westridge. So she has two students that we've enrolled since the last time I saw you, um, getting newcomer services at Westridge, which has really helped um, there. We typically in the past few years have had seen less students in grades six through eight enrolling in March and April and May. I don't know why, but that's just been historically the way it's been. So that's all that I have for you around numbers so far. So I can entertain any questions if you have them. Mr. Hawley. 70 in the last month is a big number. Are we seeing a trend? Is it from a certain location that they're coming in from? Is it um, areas? Everywhere. It? We're seeing students coming from Florida. So we have friends of friends telling them to move to Grand Island. Um, we continue to see students from Cuba um, and students from Guatemala. We just had a student from Ecuador um, enroll today. So um, a few students from Somalia. I know I talked to Whitney Flower at 2-5 Newcomers and with that additional power, para, we may not target Spanish. We may look for Somali. Because we had a student um, uh, just enroll that speaks Somali and definitely we've had to bring in some uh, additional support just for basic things like not running, you know, darting out into the parking lot to get to the bus or, you know, just different things that we've had a high school student who's amazing just come in and, and do some things with one of our paras um, over at Stolly Park. So. Thank you. Yep. Mr. Garcia Mendez. Thank you. Um, I think I have two questions. The, the first one is the staffing request. Is it enough? Um, <laughs> like why why just stop there yeah um, <laughs> thank you thank you uh, part of it is what do we need to get through the end of the school year and then I've already started having conversations with Dr. Kohler and uh, the district leadership team about the 24-25 school year mm -hmm. um, because with the increase in newcomers at Westridge with only one full-time teacher there um, we're going to have to look at services there because we'll have everybody who was currently at Walnut or Bar um, go back home to to Western so mm -hmm. okay yeah the the other one would be um, when we think about um, retaining some of the staff that we have some of those paraeducators I, I know you're like swamped but I wonder if like the <laughs> district um, has any foresight of like how can we get creative and um, with our academies, with our students, um, like getting them into a certain pathway that can help um, with some of the growing needs of the district. Um, when you start thinking about like pathway, uh, path back programs uh, with education and everything, I guess I don't know if there's any creative um, strategies that you folks have looked at nationally or anything. Um, but yeah, just putting that out there. No, it's a good food for thought. Yeah. I would say the student that we reached out to, who's a Somali speaker, Kozar, that we had help us at Stolly Park, um, she told our immigrant liaison, she's like, hmm, I never thought that this was a thing, that I could do this. I had a lot of fun, right? Like, and that I could do this as a profession. And um, and so just, uh, we, you know, have some of our students support us during parent-teacher conferences because in order for us to do parent-teacher conferences in the district, we, there's not ever enough um, interpreter and uh, translator support. So we have kind of a tip sheet that we do kind of mini training, but it, it would be great to do that more formalized to get kids thinking or students thinking about um, that as a profession. But yeah, I, this is my minimal request for right now to get us through the school year. I, I, we, and I also know that we're gonna have to then try and fill those positions to support our, te our teachers are working really hard. Um, but I know that they're, you know, at class sizes that are much larger or at the same size as some general education classroom sizes with, you know, students coming in constantly every week. So this will be super supportive. Mr. Hawley. 
kind of piggybacking off of what Mr. Garcia Mendez said, um, and I think I brought this up a couple years ago. We were chatting about this the other night. We were at a national education conference in San Diego several years back, and there was a city uh, in California that, um, you know, one night they had no refugees, and the next day they had a 1,000. Mm -hmm. and, um, and they had to come up with, with strategies to, to handle this situation. And one of the things that they did was um, they brought in some of the parents that, that were part of these families, employed them in the district as basically cultural liaisons mm -hmm. instead of paras or something like that. And I think you could pay for it out of Title I funds. I'm not quite sure how all that works. I know we've done um, some of the community school stuff here and we've had some classes at night for um, English as a second language for the adults. Have we looked at some things like that that might help us out with um, the influx that we're seeing from these different regions? Yeah, if you're, I don't remember. Um, so last year I came to you about our immigrant funds of hiring an immigrant liaison. Um, she's been helping us at the high school to kind of do some of that. We haven't, just because we've had so many new students coming in and try to onboarding students, um, we haven't been able to do any formalized like training for parents and things like that. Um, but definitely something we want to like explore with her and other positions like that when we move forward. Um, it's been helpful with the 912 program, which she supports, and even at Stolly Park, one location for parent meetings and and some of that educational pieces to go to. And she has a district cell phone, so they feel comfortable calling her, you know, to get the answers of of what they need, like in in the moment. Um, we're also looking at some opportunities this summer to get families who just arrived enrolled in school earlier because we had kind of uh, a very busy August and we want to try and prevent um, that and have as many students enroll. So part of that will be educational and bringing in some nonprofits within the community, um, doing some other opportunities just for them to understand school in the U.S. Um, by still doing the Welcome Center the Welcome Center experience with registration and assessment, but then doing lots of other opportunities for that educational piece about what school is like in the U.S. So we're kind of excited to, to launch that this summer. Thank you. Yep. Any other questions? All right. Thank you very much. All right, item number 5.4, Mr. Virgil Harden, moving activity fund bank account from Five Points to Wells Fargo. Well, good evening. Uh, in order to uh, streamline business office procedures on both a monthly and a annual basis, we would like to uh, move our uh, activity fund from Five Points Bank to Wells Fargo. Uh, I spoke with the Facility and Finance Committee meeting uh, members uh, this month and presented that to them. Uh, they didn't seem to have a lot of questions, but of course our procedure of course is to talk about it one month, give the board time to think about that, and then of course ask for approval a month from now. So the reasons why, uh, first uh, it will help us streamline our processing on a monthly basis of payroll. Uh, we're required by the retirement system to pay uh, teachers who are our employees who actually officiate for us instead of being an independent contractor as an official, they have to be paid through payroll. And so right now that requires us to then process that through our normal processes, transfer all the money then on a monthly basis. That would streamline that and let us just process it directly, basically, for lack of a better term. Uh, at the end of the year, we also have to transfer money to uh, the activity fund for just normal transfer purposes and then several accounts end up with a negative balance uh, and so we have to cover those because we don't uh, allow negative balances in the sub accounts so if cheerleading has a negative five thousand dollars in it we transfer that money and so now we physically have to write a check from one bank account move it to the other bank account and then reverse it at the beginning of the next year so a lot of busy work all of that goes away uh, by making these uh, this change so just wanted to give you a couple of uh, examples. I did meet with the fine folks at uh, Five Points Bank and assured them that we would continue to have deposit on account with them through a um, very similar type product uh, that we talked about a few months ago with the uh, Pinnacle Bank. Uh, and we basically have banks competing against each other and we'll see how they do. So we'll end up having four different banks um, having that kind of investment. 
uh, portfolio. So we aren't walking away from our 30 year or more, I don't know when we started banking with five points, it predates me. Uh, and so we won't walk away from our relationship with those folks. So next month the request would be then that we just give me authority to go ahead and move that account and then open up any necessary investment accounts and then it's just a matter of making that happen. Probably not in a big hurry, so I would look to do that at the end of this fiscal year and start it back up or make the change for September 1, basically. So that's the information I can think of that I'd wanna know if I were you. So I'll conclude my comments. All right, thank you, Mr. Tardin. Item number 5.5, .5, GAPS Communications Audit Report, Mr. Mitchell Rausch. Perfect. <laughs> okay, I think we're good. Good evening, hello everybody. Thank you for letting me crash the board meeting for a little bit. I wanted to provide an update for you all on some work that we had done last semester. We received all of that work, and so um, in true fashion, wanted to be sure to give you an update on the data. And um, similar to what Verge talked about with his process, we did share this information at our PRPD committee last week, made a couple of adjustments as well with some extra things that they said that maybe this group would want to see, so I included some additional data as well. But um, what we are going to be doing is we're going to be reviewing the communications audit that the district did last semester. Um, before we go in deep on that, though, I want to give you a little bit of context. So just a friendly reminder to you as well as to our community folks that are watching along online as well. Uh, we have a, a communications team of three full-time individuals. Myself, uh, I'm about to finish up my third school year here. Ms. Kelly Mayhew, who's our coordinator, she's been with us for five years, and then B.B. Louvino, who's been with us for about two and a half years. Those are the folks that work in a full-time capacity to support the communications efforts across the district. So why a communications audit? Um, about a decade ago, the district contracted for a deep dive communications audit, and the findings of that audit 10 years ago uh, led to the district hiring their first uh, public information officer and it also uh, helped lead to a lot of the decisions and stakeholder group meetings and um, communication efforts that fueled things like the launching of the academies the starting of the stakeholder groups that we have for the superintendent and things like that um, also helped inform the cpi transition process um, man i'm struggling with my hdmi cord i apologize all right, um, and so why do we wanna do that? Because it helps us take a peek under the hood into how are we engaging our stakeholders, our staff, our students, our families, our community. We wanna be able to check in on that on a fairly regular basis to know if what we're doing is actually helpful. <laughs> um, so 10 years ago was the last time we did a deep audit uh, 2017 2018 was the last time we did just a general communication survey just some high-level questions about perception and information and those sorts of things so uh, what you're gonna see throughout this report is us kind of comparing the the things that we found 10 years ago six years ago and what we have today but um, one of the biggest things that I really want to plant my flag on is this gives us current data so that we can really be informed about what we wanna do and move on beyond the anecdotal. That's just so helpful for, for so many reasons. There we go. I think if I hold it like this, I will be good. It's on your side? Okay, good deal. 
Um, so a little bit of history that I kind of walked through um, on how we have done audits of this degree or uh, surveys along the way as well. The other thing that I wanted to drop in here is just kind of tips for best practice. Like how do you know when it's a good time to go and take a deep dive because there was a lot of work that went into this that you're gonna see here in a little bit. Um, general best practice for stuff like this is when you have uh, new leadership in the school district or um, some new members of the school board or uh, newness in your communications department or if it's been five or more years since you've taken a deep dive. We check most of those boxes so we thought it was a good time to do that. Bless you. Um, so, how did we go about this process? We uh, contracted with the National School PR Association, or NSPRA. They are the largest organization of this type of service in the country. They've been around since 1935. They have over 2,800 members, and they are the leading experts in school communication. Um, and uh, this service is something that they provide, and so we contracted with them. They're also the same organization that we contracted with a decade ago when we did this same process. So there is some continuity there. Um, and so what they do is, is they bring their expertise and they put together a team of professionals to come in and do the audit so everything can be objective, but also measured by professionals. So this is our audit team. Uh, we had Frank Kwan who led the whole process. He is a retired school PR professional from decades of service. He's awesome. And then Sheba Clark, who's from uh, the Kansas area, she came in and helped him out. And then we had four individuals who work full time for NSPRA to uh, provide services in various competencies like measuring the survey, those sorts of things. So how did we do an audit? Again, when I said this is a deep dive, we looked at just about anything that is communicating information in the district, regardless of who the stakeholder intentions are. So um, they did a collateral review. Over the course of a month, I gathered examples of just about any sort of communication you could possibly think that we have in the district, and I put together a massive Google Drive for them to review absolutely everything. Website. Um, social media posts, branding standards, letters home to parents, um, crisis communication, videos, branding, anything that you can think of that is generated in the district. Also, stuff that is being generated at the building level by not our team, by maybe building principals or coaches and things like that. So we gave them access to an awful lot of our collateral so they could review that, check out the effectiveness of those things, our consistencies, that sort of thing. Then um, they also reviewed our strategies and our goals and the things that have been driving us the last few years since our department has had a shift. Then they also uh, deployed an electronic survey. And um, that was just kind of a typical like measuring questions on overall perception of the district, how well informed do you feel, your trust level with the district, those sorts of things. And we broke those out by staff, families, and community members. And the benchmarks that we had for participation on those were given to us for goals to try to hit of how many participants we wanted. Those were given to us by NSPRA based off of national standards for school districts that are like us, our size, our diverse makeup across the country. So we had over 330 staff members complete the survey and we had over 240 family members complete the survey the staff members surpassed the benchmark that they wanted us to hit the families was really really close community was significantly lower um, but they also told us that happens almost everywhere they go um, so when we look at some of the data in the next few slides, I will ask that you please keep the community piece with a little bit of a grain of salt just because it isn't quite the, the large group, the, the, the size of the group that we were hoping for. Data is still helpful, but it's not going to be quite as reliable as the staff and families data going forward. And then we did the focus groups, which I believe most of you participated in as well. Um, this was huge. We really wanted to do this part. Um, the, the two leaders of the review and the audit came to our district for three days and they conducted 10 different focus groups and uh, we identified those focus groups of 8 to 12 people. That was their recommendation. So we had over 120 people participate. They were um, s separated out by staff and the various levels of staff. So we had 
um, district leadership team met with them. We had a group of building principals. We had a group of teachers. We had a group of non-teacher staff. We had special education. We had custodians. We had nutrition services. We had paraprofessionals. We had translators. We had all kinds of staff represented. Um, and then for families, we had them grouped into um, like nationalities and languages so that if um, we did have a Spanish-speaking focus group, they could communicate all of that in their native language and not have to be in a predominantly English-speaking focus group. Um, so we had that for uh, families, and then we had a focus group from uh, community stakeholders, and um, yeah, so that's how we broke down the focus groups. And then all of this was done and reviewed and compared with national INSPRA benchmarks, which we're gonna share here in just a minute. And then they, the finished product was a 70 page report, which you may access on the district website. If you go to GIPS.org and go to the communications department, the full 70 page report is parked on our homepage of the communications department. I did not want to read the whole thing to you, so that's why I'm doing this. So this is the high-level stuff, but if you're looking for some riveting reading, you can check out the full 70-page report online. All right, so we're about to get into numbers. Please remember the data that we are about to review reflects the point in time of October, early November 2023. That's when we deployed the surveys. That's when we gave them access to our collateral to review, and that's when we engaged in our focus groups. I ask you to remember that because there are going to be a few things in the data that we look at that um, are probably actually going to be a little bit better than they were then because of some things that have happened in that time. If you think what was going on in that time, right? Um, we were just about to start communicating in a pretty large degree about the budget work that we've been doing. So we were right at the cusp of that. And this was also before Mr. Fisher was given the permanent superintendent spot as well too. So I ask you to remember those things because that may contribute to some of the comments and the data that we see in the next few slides. All right, so overall perception. Um, this is a high level overview of how did the people that participated in our survey and in our focus groups uh, feel about their overall perception of Grand Island Public Schools. Not just communication, just Grand Island Public Schools. So what we have on the right is the um, percentage breakdown of the feedback that we received. And then on the left is a chart that NSPRA put together for us that compares it with national benchmarks of over 150 different school districts across the country. And what you'll see there is that in every single category, staff, parents, or community, we are at or performing above the national average of overall perception of the school district. That sounds kind of like a little bit of jargon, so let me make it a little bit more exciting for you, all right? Let's compare it to how well we did the last time we asked this question, because I think that really matters to the context of what we're doing here. So in 2017, 2018, we asked the question, how likely would you be to recommend GIPS to somebody else? And we broke it down by parents, staff, and community. And those are the percentages that we received. In 2023, 2024, we did not ask the recommendation question. We asked the overall perception question. I sat down with Mr. Fisher as we were breaking down some of the data, and we felt like this was an appropriate comparison in order for us to be able to have something to look at on did we make progress or did we regress. And so what we came back with is parents are at an 83% overall perception satisfied with the district. Staff is at 94%, community is at 89%, but remember the community data might not be as quite as reliable as the other data that we have. So my personal commentary as the guy with the microphone, I will say I am incredibly encouraged to see that our numbers increased because if you look at the year stamps, the last time we asked these questions was before the pandemic. And then the next time we went deep and asked these questions of our stakeholders is fresh off of the pandemic. And I'm encouraged to see that our numbers are trending upward and that we're also right in step with national average. They're not where we want them to be, but now we know where we're at. We can be encouraged that we're heading in the right direction. That's just Mitch's commentary. 
here are some highlights from the focus group discussion that, uh, around the perception questions that are quoted and mentioned in the audit report. I don't think this will surprise anybody, but I wanna say it because it matters, right? There is a high regard for the staff that we have here in the district, all across the board. Every stakeholder, anybody you're talking to, they love our staff. because they know that our staff are dedicated and committed. And one of the direct quotes is, our staff are the boots on the ground. The boots on the ground staff really care about what they do and our students. I'm, I never tire of hearing that. Um, we're also commended on the development of the stakeholder groups that we've had and how active those groups are, how regularly they, they meet and how they um, help shape conversation in the district. Instructional opportunities for students were noted as high quality. Uh, quote, the academy structure is positive. More kids are college and career ready now. That's good news. There is optimism that the tide is turning with new leadership making leaders more approachable. Now remember, these conversations were happening in October and November. And you're gonna see in a recommendation that we have later that we really wanna lean into the trust opportunity that we believe we have here in the district. Um, I think it's better now and I think the school board is also listening. Shout out to y'all, put that in there for you. Um, and then this was something that is maybe my favorite component of the, the whole report. Um, Frank Kwan came back at the end of the audit and he sat down with Mr. Fisher and I before he hopped on a plane to go home. And he's done dozens of these things all over the country. And he's like 30 year veteran of school PR. He sat down and he looked Mr. Fisher in the eye and he said, the high school student group that I spent time with was the most impressive group of students I've ever worked with. So I'm proud of our Islanders. I'm also not surprised if you spent any time with our student leaders at the high school that is on brand. And then this quote, one of the students in that group, I was not in the room, but um, one of the students in the, in the room was quoted as saying, I look at it like a whiteboard with one black dot. The dot is what we focus on, but the white is what we're all about. And I think that's a really good way to sum up, you know, conversation around what is your perception of the school district and what are the good things that are going on? What are your frustrations? But very impressive student experience for our auditors. Okay, so overall satisfaction. Now, this is more directly related to the level of communication and information that people are receiving from the district, all right? Now, again, I'm giving you a high level overview. We asked like 10 questions in each of these categories. I'm just giving you the big nuggets because I don't have a ton of time. Um, so on the right are the scores that we received from our stakeholders on their overall satisfaction with the communication that they are receiving from the district. I'm really sorry about this. HDMI situation. All right, and then on the left is how we compare with national average. For staff, we're ahead of the national pace. For uh, parents, we are uh, 0.1 below the national pace, and for community, we are above the national pace. But how does that compare to last time? Here's how we compare to last time. So in 2017 and 2018, we did not use the words overall satisfaction. We used how well informed were you? And again, I sat down with Mr. Fisher and we looked and we felt like the how well informed are you is a good comp to the overall satisfaction with communication question. And so you can see the growth that we had from 2017, 2018 to this current year. Parents at 89%, staff at 94%, community at 90%. Again, maybe not necessarily exactly where we want, but we're trending in the right direction, especially coming fresh off the heels of the pandemic. Some focus group themes from the satisfaction conversation. GIPS consistently uses strong design themes and key colors, clearly establishing a visual brand for the district. Communications are easy to understand, timely and accurate, and they know where and how to direct a question, complaint or concern. For me, selfishly, I was like, yes, people know, to, know where to go to get help. I'm so grateful for that. Um, one quote from the report said, I trust the communication I receive. Parents and staff agreed strongly that the communications are open and transparent. I think that's, that's good. Um, some other quotes um, that we received are, while district communications is strong, building level consistency is still an opportunity for growth. 
Um, some quotes are, quality of communication all depends on the principal and varies from building to building. I think that's a fair assessment. While the instruction is good, communications are dependent on the teacher's desire to communicate. There's not a lot of consistency between the buildings with what information is offered and how things are provided. So those are some of the trends that we saw in the focus groups on the satisfaction piece. Here is a general SWOT analysis. Um, I put this in here as a visual representation for you. It pretty much captures everything that is in this presentation, so I'm not going to walk through every single bullet point, but they put it together for us. It looks nice and it's organized, so you can refer back to this, but it, it hits on everything that uh, we're walking through today. So another portion of the process is we asked for their communication preferences and what type of information they like to receive from those things. I have our stakeholder responses top 12. I just provided the top five for the sake of this presentation. All right. So um, emails, number one, it's always going to be, and I'm totally fine with that. Um, it's direct communication that's translatable with our stakeholders. Um, for parents, uh, the top five is email, text message, social media, newsletters, and word of mouth. Staff preference, email, newsletters, calendar, word of mouth, and social media. I'm going to give you a little bit more of Mitch's commentary here, here so this is just me, all right? A um, couple of things that I see here. Number one that's interesting and I think encouraging is the social media, while not surprising they're in the top five, they're a little bit lower than they were. I think that's good. Social media is nice, but as I'm going to show you some numbers later, because the social media game actively combats against branded pages, the engagement is just not as reliable as you want it to be. So I don't want social media to be in the top two. You know? um, and then the challenge for us going forward is website, district website, was either number six or number seven for our two groups. Our team was looking at this data and we were talking about it. Our goal for the next time we have this data is we want to see our district website in the top five. So that's something that we're going to be shooting for. Because I would rather use, continue to use social media as a storytelling opportunity, but not have it be as valuable as our district website for our folks to know where they can go and get their helpful information. So that tells us the work that we've got to do. So here's some social media breakdown. Um, I don't think this is going to surprise anybody that pays attention to what we're doing online, but this is the overall preferred usage of social media for the three different stakeholders that we connected with. Facebook blows everybody else out of the water. That's not a surprise, and, um, but it's good to have the data. Instagram and uh, X Twitter are coming in at second place, but we're going to probably be moving away from our reliance on Twitter over the next year or so because that platform has a lot of problems. So social media performance, this is a little bit more about like how effective are we being, how are things performing. I really, this is a little bit inside baseball, but I wanted to provide this information to you because understandably, our team fields a lot of questions about Facebook. And I get that, that's fine. Sometimes Facebook is a fun place to go. Um, but the thing that, we, that I want people to understand is just because you have 16,000 followers on a Facebook page does not mean 16,000 people are going to see a post, right? And I think we understand that, but it's important to remember, especially in the metaverse, meta controls Facebook and Instagram. Like I said earlier, um, they've come out and changed their algorithm the last couple of years and have said that we actively um, limit the branded type of content that people see in their news feeds compared to personal content from their friends because that's the experience they want to provide. So I share this information with you for two reasons. One, so we can get a frame of reference for the kind of engagement level we're really talking about here. But then two, so we can be proud that GIPS is performing well. Facebook right now, the national average for branded school pages of engagement is at 0.15%. The time that we were reviewed, we we're operating at a 0.22%. I think now we're probably closer to about 2.5. Twitter. We're, uh, the national average is at 0.5, we're at 1%. Instagram, the national average is at 0.6%, we're at over 2%. So I want those numbers to be higher because I want people to see the great things that our students and our teachers are doing, but I also take encouragement in knowing that we are breaking through, which is good to know. Sorry. The slides are only on this screen for me and not my laptop, so if it goes black, i got to wait. <laughs> 
Um, and then just some basic growth numbers. It's kind of like empty calories, but it's nice to know. Um, growth that we've had on our social media platform since 2022, Facebook over 2000 followers added Twitter over 630, Instagram over 200, YouTube over 130. Um, one thing I do want to point out though, is if you go and take a deep dive in our social media, um, you'll see that our YouTube engagement is significantly lower than everything else for now. That is by design. We tested some things out when I first got here and the videos that we release, they perform a whole lot better and more people see them if we upload them natively to the social media platforms rather than just dropping in a YouTube link. So what we typically do is, is when we have a video that we want a lot of people to see, we'll post it on a prime time that we know that we have the highest level of people watching. We'll post it natively. And then when we do secondary and tertiary posts, we recycle with the YouTube link. Um, so again, coming back to what I talked about, how I don't want to overly rely on social media, but it's also a helpful storytelling tool. Uh, more than half of the surveyed parents, staff, and community men members say they rely on social media daily or weekly for information from the district. So for us going forward as a department, we're going to try to find that balance of how can we continue to use those platforms to showcase the great things taking place in our district, but not have it become the, the, the most trusted place because we know that it's not gonna get seen by as many people. Um, when you go back through in either the report or the slide deck, we uh, got word bubbles from each of the stakeholder groups. They were asked to share how could you describe Grand Island Public Schools in one word. I love these things, so I dropped them in here so you could have them. Um, I don't think many of them are going to be a surprise to you, but for the sake of time, I'm just going to keep flying through. All right, recommendations. So. We did all that stuff, right? We asked questions, we had conversations, we reviewed materials and we measured data and all that sort of stuff. So then at the end of that, very similarly to the NDE process, we get some recommendations from the pros to say like, hey, y'all are doing really good at this stuff, so here's where you need to take it to the next level or here's an area of improvement that you have. So we received six recommendations. I'm gonna go through them really quickly for you and then we can talk next steps. All right. Recommendation number one, complete the development of a comprehensive strategic communication plan. So since I have been here in the district, we have not officially had a full strategic communication plan for a couple of reasons. Number one, the first school year that I was here for, um, it was, and I'm not saying that this is a bad thing, but it was all hands on deck for pandemic support. That was the priority there. And that's okay. That's what it needed to be. So year one, we didn't have one. And then um, <clears throat> year, this transition between year two and year three, our strategic plan was kind of in a little bit of fluidity. And I know you all know that, right? As we were trying to reevaluate the priorities of the district and everything, our team actually built out a full comprehensive marketing plan about our old strategic plan, but it was ultimately tabled because we weren't for sure it was going to capture what the new narrowed focus was going to be for the district. So we've had goals in our department and we've had benchmarks that we've been aiming to make and we've been measuring a lot of things, but we haven't had a full strategic communication plan. So um, that's a recommendation that we received and I'll get to the next steps on that here on the next slide. Uh, recommendation two, standardized parent family communication process across schools, departments and districts, right? That's not a surprise based on the data that we received. Those of you that have been uh, frequent visitors to our parent advisory council meeting, that's not a surprise and that's not a bad thing. You know, we really did a good job the last two and a half years of establishing the district voice, starting the process of building up back trust. Now the next step is let's get that level of consistency and excellence and expectation up to the building communication with parents. Um, number three, build a greater awareness of and expand resources for meeting the information needs of diverse students and their families. Again, I don't think that's a surprise to anybody. We are a richly diverse school district. Um, Dr. Levos is keeping us surprised of the, the wonderful students that we get to serve here, but we've got to continue to be um, adaptive and flexible in how we are supporting those students and families. And from a communications perspective, we've got to do better. So I agree with that recommendation. Recommendation four, um, enhance decision-making processes to maintain and build um, something like build trust uh, along those lines. Um, 
growing sense of trust in the district leadership. So this was directly related to a lot of the focus group conversation, again, at the end of October, was around how we feel like things are headed in the right direction, we feel like we have the right leaders and the right board members, but we want to know if it's sustainable and you've got a massive opportunity to lean into the trust that we're building. I feel like we're continuing down on that path, um, but that, that's reflective, I think, very much of the time when we received uh, the feedback from folks. Number five, provide communications training for administrators and key frontline staff. This it goes hand in hand with recommendation number two. The best thing that we can do to help our buildings more confidently communicate about things taking place in the classroom is the, the communications department can make it a priority to consistently be in front of our leaders and our key frontline staff to help them feel more confident, give them the tools that they need. Um, and then number six um, was something really fancy. <laughs> Implement multimodal communication strategies to increase stakeholder knowledge about district finances. It's a lot of words. That means when we were talking to people in October, they knew budget stuff was going to happen. And we were just starting to ramp up the big theme that we kind of had for the year, which was all of our communication around the budget work that we've been doing, right? So at that time, of course, that was an awful lot of the conversation, which was, oh, I understand that they're working on the budget. I'm not quite sure what it's going to be yet, or I'm a little nervous about the budget. I hope they tell me more. Um, <clears throat> so if you read the report, they actually made an amendment to the report after they gave us the first draft of it back in February, because we jumped on a call with our audit team, and they asked us, hey, you told us that you were about to do this big grand thing about communicating about the budget right after we left. How did it go? And we walked them through it all, and they were like, that actually sounds like you guys did a pretty good job. We're going to amend the report to say that, like, we want you to keep doing more of this on a regular year-to-year -year basis because you're doing a good job of communicating the process, but you also don't want to unintentionally condition your public to think that they only hear from you about the budget when things are reducing. So that's the reframed recommendation there is y'all did a really good job of rolling it out. The challenge is to try to do that every year so that everyone can feel informed about the budget regardless of what the budget status is. So what's next? I promise I'm almost done. What's next? All right. Taking those recommendations in stride, continued streamlining of digital communications. We built the district's first brand new website since 2017. That's done. The mobile app is going to be launched soon. First new one we've had in a really long time. Um, you're going to hear about this more during policy, so I won't spend too much time on it. Social media migration to class intercom, this is huge, but we're going to talk about that later. Um, enhancing something. <laughs> enhancing the s'more newsletters with a more curriculum-minded focus. So the newsletter system that we sent out, um, we... Uh, equipped all of our schools with a newsletter system that our department pays for so they don't have to pay for it and they're performing really really well almost all of our buildings are sending them on a weekly clip what we want to do now now that they've had it all for a year is next year we want to give them the tools that they can have to once a month let those newsletters really drill in on instruction taking place that month in the classroom we want to start being a little bit more strategic about those sorts of things Um, so craft strategic communications plan in concert with the new strategic plan that will be rolled out for the next school year. Perfect time to do all of that. Y'all are going to hear about the new strategic plan a lot over the next couple months, so I'm not going to belabor that point, but we will be ready and it's going to be awesome. Um, I know, I know one of them was talking about a staff ambassadors type program, and that may be a bad label for it, but um, one of the most illuminating things I read in our report was how much feedback, positive feedback, we got from our own staff members saying, I wish I could be more useful in sharing helpful information about the district when I'm at the grocery store or at church or at random basketball game have a lot of good feedback on that of the staff saying like, we would love to be able to help share the message more. We just need a mechanism to do that. 
I don't know what that's going to be, but we're going to have something. One of the ideas that Enspra dropped in for us to consider is an ambassador's program of some kind of, if you've got some staff members that aren't administrators, sorry administrators, <laughs> but just staff members that are interested in learning more and want to be more proactive and talking confidently about the district, start a group and meet with them regularly. So I don't know what it's going to look like, but this is too good of an opportunity to not do something with it. When you've got people coming to you saying, hey, we want to help and we want to do good stuff. Cool. Let's do it. Build in regular opportunities for build and leader um, and key frontline staff training. We talked about that. Maintain the budget communication cycle and then research resources and opportunities for better language and cultural support. All right. Um, couldn't have done this without some really amazing people. So before I open it up for questions, I do just want to shout out, uh, first of all, to the district leadership team who said, yes, we could do this when I was like, we should. And they were like, OK. Um, and then also to y'all for your support to this. Um, we started talking to the PRPD committee about this um, be uh, like before the summer last summer saying we wanted to do this. And I also just want to thank you all for your continued support uh, and valuing of communication in GIPS. Um, a lot of school districts look to us and ask us how and why we do what we do in terms of communication. When we launched our new website, I had schools reaching out to us and saying, we want that, what did you do? When we do big strategic things like this or when we launch videos, people are constantly shocked when I tell them, we're doing this all in-house. We're not paying 10,000s of dollars for an agency to do this sort of stuff. They look to us, but that's a testament to you prioritizing that and making sure that we value communication in the district. I also want to thank Jennifer Worthington. Um, she's not with us. She's watching online. She texted me that she was going to watch online. Um, so hi, Jennifer. But um, she was a big engine behind all of this. She championed this project, and she organized all the focus groups. Kelly and Bibi, the two best school PR professionals a uh, director could ask for, and then everybody that participated in the survey and the focus groups. This is why we're able to now take a look and see where we're at and go and be better. It's because of all those people. So... Um, and then, of course, our why. It's all about our students, and it's all about getting them what they need when they need it. And that is why I do what I do. That's why Kelly and BB do what they do, is to um, get our students happy about achieving great things. All right. Thank you for bearing with me. <laughs> I, full disclosure, when I finished up this slide deck, Mr. Fisher was like, Mitch, how long is this going to go? <laughs> And I said, well, in PRPD, I think it was 20 minutes, but we were at stopping for questions along the way. And he goes, OK, well, this is important, so you just go. So <laughs> anyway, I want to open the floor for questions, comments, concerns, smart remarks, whatever. What, what, have, what have we got? Mr. Hawley. No questions, Mitch. Um, what a great presentation. Uh, and kudos to you for bearing through the technical difficulties. I know that wasn't <laughs> easy. Um, I think it's important to note that um, there's a lot of great things going on in Grand Island Public Schools. And at times, the narrative gets skewed out in the public. Uh, but, but here's the proof, right, that, yeah, we're not perfect. Um, but we have great students. We have great staff. We have great leadership. And, and that's being recognized. And like you said, you know, our numbers are on an upward trajectory. So great job to you and your team for the communications that you put out. And just keep up the good work. Thank you. Thank Appreciate you. it. Ms. Albers. <clears throat> I'll ditto Josh Hawley's remarks and just thank you for what you do and thank you to your team and you're always super positive and willing to ask questions and just know that we're here for you if there's anything the board can do uh, to make your life a little bit easier or, um, just please ask so thank you thank you it means a lot and I'll just say the way y'all are supporting us now is just amazing I it's just great it's really great so thank you Mr. Garcia Mendez thank you um Kudos to you and your staff, um, everybody that was involved too. Um, I'd say uh, I was reading some of the um, audit, the 70 page audit, because right. um, this was my second time hearing it. Mm -hmm. So I was like, oh, I've heard that. Um, <laughs> right. I've heard that song. <laughs> like, let me dig deeper. Um, these recommendations look pretty awesome. Um, I really like what they have to say about um, developing that website to better accommodate the different languages yep. um, in different districts. And I like how they gave different examples. Um, from other school districts, um, like in Minnesota, I believe, 
Um, but yeah, I think it, this is really great. I think there's a lot to build from here. And as we head into strategic planning um, as a district, I think this meshes really well uh, with everything that's going on. So yeah, looking forward to it. Awesome. Thanks for going deep on the PDF. So there, there may not be many. <laughs> Mr. Sykes. Hey, the a question I had uh, when looking at the overall satisfaction, those comparison questions you had, I know you guys had to do your best to work at finding comparable. You did that with Mr. Fisher. Mm -hmm. I would love to see that being kind of in finding a way uh, using our communication platforms uh, to do an evaluation on questions like that year to year because those questions of overall satisfaction um, and perception and all of that is a good thing to be able to keep your keep your thumb on. So I, I would love to not have to, this isn't your fault, I'd love to not have to wait 10 years to get like, you know, yeah. it's kind of like going to the doctor for a checkup each year. Okay, how are we doing with this? And was it strategic uh, by the organization that did the evaluation that they didn't include students? Um, that's a really good question. So they included students in the focus groups. Right, I saw that part. Um, we had the option to include students for the electronic survey if we wanted to, just high school students, but it was going to hit around the same time as the culture and climate survey. And um, we had a talk at the district leadership team level, and we felt like um, that we wanted to, we didn't want to have any confusion or fatigue on surveys. And if we had to pick, <clears throat> excuse me, if we had to pick a priority between the two, at that time the culture and climate survey was a higher priority for student feedback. But um, thank you for affirming the, the frequency of how often we should be asking those questions. I'm inclined to agree. Okay. Thank you very much. I appreciate your, your efforts, Mr. Rush. Thank you, everybody. Item number 5.6, reduce specific staff positions, Dr. Kohler. I have a resolution to present to the board tonight, and I'll just read through it. Whereas due to changing programs, budget limitations, and other administrative and financial factors, it is necessary that programs and staff positions offered by Grand Island Public School District be reviewed and that a determination be made as to those programs and staff positions that should be discontinued, reduced, or changed. And whereas the school board has considered the foregoing and determined that it is necessary and appropriate to reduce programs and staff positions. Now, therefore, be it resolved that changes in programs and the following reductions in staff positions are made effective at the end of this 2023-24 school year. Eliminate the following certified full-time equivalent. 1.0 FTE social worker position effective as of May 23rd, 2024. Questions? Questions for Dr. Cole? Fisher. Not really a question, just a, a comment. I, I think that uh, certainly when we came into this process, we, we were expecting 30 plus uh, potential potential reductions. Um, and so I, I think um, our hope was is that we would be able to get to a point where um, we were at a, a fairly minimal number of staff that, that were displaced from the district. Um, and, and to be down to one, I think, at this point in time is, is really uh, a good outcome for us. Now, obviously, we still don't like the fact that we've got this one position that we're looking at tonight. Um, Last month, we, we looked at three different positions, and, and they were part of the RIF plan that was put in place last month. Um, we've been able to, to find a position for one of those three individuals. But uh, again, we're excited about being down to the fairly small number, but, but we certainly uh, are, are very uh, cognizant of the impact for those three individuals, and, and we certainly want to, to continue to look for opportunities for them and help them to, to find a good landing in this position. So, otherwise, I, thanks to Dr. Kohler and, and uh, the work that HR has done to, to really do the shuffling, the hard, 
hard work and obviously our building principles has been a part of that too to, to identify where we could move people who were displaced. So good work. Mr. Hawley. Piggybacking off some of your comments, Mr. Fisher, uh, just trying to make sure I understand. A month ago we did talk about reducing two of these positions, now we're down to one. Is that due to some shuffling that happened in reassigning somebody to a different position? Can you talk about that? Yes, attrition, um, a new position that came open that was certified. We just continue to look for places. Thank you. Ms. Salvers. And, and so even if this position is rift, it still could be that you will find a spot for this person within the district. Okay, Actually, I just they have two years from here. Um, we will continue to look for a position for that person. Okay, thank you. All right. Thank you, Dr. Kohler. On to number 5.7, policy. Mr. Fisher. All right. We'll see if we have any better luck than Mitch did. They said it's working on the live stream, even when it disappears here. So since I have mine in front of me, I'll be okay. Okay. Um, policies that we're taking a look at uh, in terms of our, our first read um, this month. Um, and, and these are going to tie, for the most part, to uh, information that uh, Mitch... All right, I better make sure I'm in the right spot here. That didn't look quite right. Okay. Um, again, going back to, to communications and, and uh, how we would want um, some of the interactions that take place with... Uh, communications um, one of the th the the policies 6252 um, as we start going through things we felt like there needed to be a, a defined boundary between staff and students in terms of electronic communications we've had policy 6252 um, that has outlined those boundaries um, but felt like there was a need for some additional language uh, in terms of electronic communications. And so, as you see there, we've added that uh, red statement dealing with electronic communications between staff and students. Um, and again, may only take place through, um, I don't have to make that bigger, I'm gonna have to get better eyes one or the other. <laughs> take place through uh, school email or district approved communication platforms. Um, coordinating communication through unapproved third-party apps is not permitted. So again, this is one of those changes, not unlike the cell phone policy at the high school, that's going to take some work to get in place. Um, we know that we have a number of uh, staff members that communicate through third-party apps. Um, and so helping to define what apps we're going to use um, and exactly how those communications are going to take place is going to be part of the work that, that goes along with, with uh, this statement within policy. Um, and again, we had discussion around this with the policy committee. Um, feel like we need to get the policy in, in place so that, that the work can, can really begin around that. Um, but it's not going to happen overnight. There's, there's definitely work to be done uh, around getting to, to where we want to be with those communications. And again, email, that's pretty straightforward, pretty simple. What's that approved app? Um, we talked the other day in the uh, committee that, uh, you know, maybe that's Google Chat. Again, the bottom line of what we want to get out of this is we want to be able to have uh, communications that, that are, are basically um, have a record of so that 
you know, there, there can't be questions later on about, well, what was the communication and who was it directed to and, and, and what was it? And so we really want to steer all of our, our staff members to using those communication tools where there is a record. Um, again, for obviously student safety, but, but for staff protection as well. So that's, that's where that policy is. Uh, questions about that? Mr. Hawley. Mr. Fisher, two questions. Um, number one, and you may not know the answer to this, um, but how do we determine which apps are approved, right? So um, typical social media, I'm assuming, is, is not what we're after, but different organizations or different sports use different apps to communicate with students. Is there some kind of a vetting committee? Um, do we um, have several ones that are approved that we can choose from? How does that work? It, it, it'll all be vetted <coughs> through the, the communications department. That's, that's going to be part of uh, what we put uh, in front of Mitch and, and his group to, to really identify what are those. And, and ultimately, a big part of the vetting process is, is this something that runs through um, an app that the school has the ability to monitor. And so that's, that, that will certainly narrow down what, what could potentially be an approved wrap. Mitch? May I clarify one yep. thing? Um, Mr. Fisher is absolutely right. There is also one other part of the process that I want to make sure you all know about as well, and that is that of the district IT team. Mr. Gearhart and his crew, they are absolute all-stars. There is nothing that we use at the district level that has not been thoroughly vetted by them first. You name the platform that we have in the district, they've got to say that it's clean before we do anything with it. So that's that's the first part of the process. And then the next step then is working through, you know, either if it's communications or L4L or whatever respective departments need to be to then go from there. But we only start working with platforms that have been approved by the IT <coughs> team. Perfect, thank you. And I have a follow-up question, um, not necessarily along the same lines, but how are we planning on communicating this to the staff? So we, uh, we make changes to policies every month and it goes into the handbook and it's available to read at your discretion. I think that this policy change is absolutely vital to deliver in some format to our teaching staff, especially the folks at the high school. Um, having children in the district, I know, for example, that perhaps their Facebook friends or their Instagram friends or whatever. Um, and I don't know if that's appropriate. And also, I mean, could show bias too. If, if, if it's not for all and it's only for some, are we planning on putting this into an email and putting it in their inbox? Probably. Uh, it will be an email into inbox plus a number of other. I mean, I think this is one of those pieces that we're going to communicate multiple ways, multiple times. Um, again, I think when you think about the, the cell phone policy at the high school, I think this has to be an approach very similar to that in terms of, you know, we're really going to have to communicate to staff members. We're also going to have to communicate to, to students and families that here, here's, here's what we're doing, here's what we're moving towards, and here's why. And so I, I think it's going to be a, a very concerted effort um, to make sure that it's well communicated. It is, you know, and again, what's the, the cleanest, best way to do this? I mean, we're going to put a policy in place, and we know that we're not going to be meeting that policy on day one when that policy right. goes into place. We're, we're going to have to spend some time getting to the point where we are meeting um, what, what the policy is. And one more thing. Yep. Um, uh, and just so um, you all know, and then as well for everyone watching along, um, this has been shared with our uh, district administrators, and um, we've, we've shared this information with them and given them a chance to provide feedback, especially with the social media piece that's coming up next to. They've, all, they've uh, had a chance to weigh in on that. And even I sat down individually with the GISH admin team and then separately with the GISH activities office. No one is going to say that this is easy. And to my knowledge, this is the first time we have made this a priority in the district. So it's a lot. But I bring this forward to say that, um, especially at the high school level, our leaders have looked me in the eyes and said, this is the right thing to do. We're going to start doing the work. 
Um, if you're looking for a timeline, we're probably not going to start like being fully implemented with some of these things until next school year. But our, the leaders in the building where we have the most change apt to happen, they're on board and we'll, we'll put a plan together. Yeah, and I wasn't looking for a timeline. Obviously, like we talked about with the cell phone policy, it's going to take time to get this implemented. Uh, but I like, I like this policy change a lot. Uh, and to know that the administrative team at the high school especially is backing this um, and at the activities office is good to know. So thank you both. Any other questions on this one? Okay, if not... Um, Hold on. Uh, sorry, Matt. Oops, oh, Mr. Sorry, Holinsky, Dave. I didn't see your... Sorry, guy in the corner over here. Um, how is this, and this may be splitting hairs, say I'm a teacher, and I have a student that goes to senior high as well, and I'm texting back and forth with my student, is this policy going to get in the way of that? You, you're, you're texting back and forth with your child. Okay, but is there anything in here that states that? Um, you know, probably it, there isn't anything necessarily that, that specifically addresses that. Um, and maybe that's something that we need to, to give some thought to. And again, that's why we do this, this initial read. And, and, uh, and so maybe there is, maybe there's something there that we need to, um, you know, talk about that, you know, because we're not trying to, to interfere with that. We're, you know, we're trying to, to, to really think about, well, where are those, you know, um, not parent, child, communications Correct. taking place okay just so, a thought yep good thought it there's a statement at the very end that it says appropriate exceptions are permitted to the foregoing for legitimate legitimate health blah 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 between employees and their children who are students in the district so it's there it's already covered so I, no, I didn't realize there was two pages I stopped yeah <laughs> All right. Anything else on this one? All right. Next one's simpler. Credit for professional training beyond a bachelor's degree. Um, this is this is information that's covered in another policy, um, and this is actually more of a procedural type uh, statement, and that procedure is covered in the staff handbook. So we're proposing to just eliminate. 6324. Questions on that? All right. Now we get back to complicated stuff. Communications and media relations. Actually, this one's not too bad. Um, so 9220 um, actually was uh, previously reports to the public. And again, this is a policy that was duplicated in another one of our policies. Uh, I think 9210 uh, incorporates all of the same information that was in this 9220. So we're proposing to eliminate the language that was in 9220 before and then replace 9220 with uh, what would be an entirely new policy. Um, it's not all in red. It probably would have been better if we'd have made this all red because this is all new. Um, but uh, anyhow, it, it really is just a statement in policy of what our practice has been for, you know, uh, a long time in terms of how we handle media inquiries and, and again, channeling um, those inquiries through our communications um, team, I think, is, is what we've, we've typically done. Um, if uh, then then moves down to the requesting media coverage, and this would be in those situations where a particular building maybe wants the media to come in and cover some event. Again, making sure that we run that through the communications department, so that again, not that we don't want our our individual buildings to to have the ability to do those things. We just want to make sure that we have a uh, a handle on what's you know what's being um, seen and and you know projected in terms of uh, 
media across the district. And so, so again, that's just that. And then that no media list, um, again, we've, we've had um, parents, given parents the ability to request their child's image or uh, any information about their child not be shared with, with any media outlets. And again, this is just a statement of that in policy. So anything we miss on that, Mitch? I think the only thing I would add to that is, again, um, kind of reaffirming what Mr. Fisher said, it's not about limiting stories or transparency. It is about making sure that um, before a camera is allowed to go into one of our schools, the person carrying the camera has been vetted to protect the personal identifying information about our students. That's the real thing. And again, this has been the same practice we've had for years, even before I got here. We just don't have a policy for it. So that's, that's why. Any questions on that? All right. Then this last one deals... Um, with online media accounts and posts, again, it's a, a new policy that uh, is being proposed. And, and again, this is, I think Mitch talked about uh, the communication that's, that's gone on with uh, district administrators as far as really trying to get a handle on the, the different social media accounts that <clears throat> are out there representing Grand Island Public Schools and, and really trying to, to, to limit those. And as we discussed in the um, policy committee the other day, I think there's, there's some real advantages for all of our groups um, to be, you know, seen through one social media account rather than everyone having their own social media account and, and uh, follow, you know, pushing... Um, you know, all of our users to, to things that represent Grand Island Public Schools as a whole rather than um, pushing them towards individual um, activity accounts or school accounts. Um, and again, what, what's being proposed here, if you look through it, is that each of our buildings would have a social media account and the high school would have a social media account and the activities department at the high school would have a social media account. And so rather than having a, a football page and a cross-country page, all of those would start using the high school activity account to uh, post their social media on. And so, again, I think it's just we've ran into situations uh, a number of different times where we had a change in leadership of a, a particular group, and all of a sudden no one has access to the account because – whoever set it up and, and started that account had all of the password information. And so, and again, you know, if, you know, rather than making people look all over for information about Grand Island schools and different activities, um, the idea is really just to direct them to uh, one particular account for the school that they're looking for. So, that's, that's the short and sweet uh, version of what's here. I'm sure I missed some stuff. Mitch, anything I need to add before we take questions? And then you might as well be up here for the questions. <laughs> <laughs> um, one, one other big piece, uh, as you scroll through that, you'll see is also um, the use of a third approved third-party social media platform. Um, the real reason we're, we're doing this or we're asking for you to give us permission to do this is um, because we want to maintain safety for all the people that are posting on behalf of the school district. And we also want to maintain autonomy of that and control of that. And so if we use an approved platform like what we're going to use is Class Intercom, it's the largest school friendly social media management platform and it started by a Gish alum, which is really cool. Um, but um, that allows the district to um, control the administration accounts, the logins, the passwords, and that sort of thing, and then allow us to let building principals or teachers or coaches have posting access to, their, to the pages, but not have the account credentials. So that 
um, we can continue to maintain that. So if there is a change in whoever's doing that role or whatever, we don't have to go through the uh, headache of that. And then also the other piece is the third party platform that we would use allows us to backlog everything for public records, legal requirements, and FOIA requests as well too. So that's the other half of this policy. Now, I didn't craft this out of thin air. Lincoln Public Schools just did this two years ago because they had a big scare for their primary Facebook account a couple of years ago where something got hacked. And they were like, we need to do something differently. And um, so they've been mentoring us through this process because they've done, they're two years ahead of us in the work. And when I asked about their policy, they were like, do you want it? And I was like, yeah. And they're like, yeah, sure, take it. And it's like, great. So really what we have here is the same policy that LPS has with some nuances changed for what's applicable to us. Questions? I don't know who was first and who was second, but. Thank you. <laughs> um, I think I have two questions. The first one would be, does so this doesn't allow um, academies from having their own social media, <laughs> correct? Correct. Okay, because I know that there's some out there. Yep, so the yeah. idea is, um, if this gets approved, the idea would be to take all of the really good content that's being generated in just small pockets and kind of inconsistently okay. and funnel it to pages that have huge audiences that will just be updated regularly, right? So okay. if you think about like a sports team, they typically only post during their time of their season. Mm -hmm. And then they've got to try to build an audience on their page. And that's a lot of work. Mm -hmm. Well, if we were to create an Islanders activities page for the high school, that thing would get thousands of followers in a day. And then we have content being generated by every season and everything going on and it's all going to one place same thing with the academies we don't have academy presence individually for all of them already anyway mm -hmm. and there's already almost 10,000 followers on the existing grand island senior high facebook page mm -hmm. so let's take the content those folks are doing and put it on the page where the audience already is okay thank you uh the next one is does any anti-discrimination kind of um, language need to be added to any of this policy or is that just for or like if someone posts anything that's discriminatory towards any student or um, group that's a really good question um, and I guess I let you weigh in on that I've got some language mm -hmm. that um, uh, other school districts in Nebraska use that I would like to put on our pages when this is approved but I kind of felt like that was more of a um, handbook sort of thing and not necessarily yeah. a policy sort of thing but okay. that's also not my expertise so i'm i'm open to conversation yeah. i guess i'm curious yeah. and i think i mean i think you could build it into this policy i i think you know we're we have that as a a guiding you know principle and practice for everything that we do so i think if you think about any any of the you know whether it's a social media policy here or policies and how we're going to deal with employees or how we're going to deal with students that's always an underlying part of you know every policy expectation is is that 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 and a discriminatory piece is going to exist okay mr holly i have a couple of questions as well um mitch will you be setting standards for how often we want posts. So for example, um, I was speaking with some constituents this week and they were saying, you know, um, we don't really know what's going on in the school, which I'm not saying that that's your fault or anybody else's, right? But when we talk about academy pages, Miss Jill's third grade class page, the high school page, athletics, if it's all into one place now, um, it's gonna be a lot easier for people to find. Are you gonna be like, hey, every, once a week, we want you to send something on the sports that are current or uh, the different academies? Will you put something like that in place to have consistent postings? Mm -hmm. Yes, and that is going to be part of the training that we talked about during the INSPRA audit, right? Um, some of the resources and tips and training that we're gonna be providing to everybody is gonna be along those same lines as well. Because the other piece that we wanna start moving away from is, less reliance on social media for like logistical things and more about like here's what we're doing so it's not going to be practice move to 5 a.m now we're going to let our um our activities directors 
have access to our mass communications platform that has texting ability on that that's trackable and vetted. And so that will remove that piece. So then the posting will be more about here's our schedule for games mm -hmm. or here's a snapshot of what went down in science class today. And so that's going to be part of the training that we provide. Like really just telling our story. <laughs> yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Perfect. Um, next question, the vetting of people. So does this tie in at all? For example, we have certain families who, for whatever reason, um, we have like pickup lists, like grandma can pick up, mom can pick up, aunt can pick up, that's it. Will we be tying this, uh, and I think we have lists of people that can't visit or cannot come, will we be tying that in when you're vetting who is going to be allowed to view the websites, or is that just too much of a deep dive in? Yeah. Do you feel so, where I'm going with this? Yeah, I, I think I'm tracking with you. I'm going to attempt to answer, and if I miss, just say Mitch, not even close. Got That's it. fine. Um, so in this policy, which I know you all haven't had much time to process it yet, it speaks to the process of who is going to be given posting access through the third-party platform, which is Class Intercom for now, but we don't name it in the policy because it could change in 10 years. I don't know. Um, so the stipulations are must be approved by your building administrator if you're at a building level must be a full-time employee of the district we're really after you've got to have a gips email address and you got to work for us full-time and then even then once you're approved by your building administrator that's still got to come to me or my team in order for us to approve and grant access does that answer your question no, you okay. missed, but it's my fault because I explained it poorly. All right. I'm talking about the other side. So we know who's posting. Yeah. Do we know who's viewing? Like maybe oh. I can't, I don't have rights to the child that, uh, for whatever reason, I, and I'm I not allowed to pick we up. Would, we would struggle to block That's access. That's what I was thinking. It'd be hard. Um, and, and we don't, no I mean, it's, comes in. It's, it's not something we do now. Um, so I, I again I, I think I number one I don't know that logistically it's even we could possible do it. yeah and I think there probably would be some legal ramifications in terms of you know blocking access to certain people in the public to a, a public website right right now um, I guess two things I would suggest one is this is one way the no media list is helpful because if we have students that are in that type of a situation um, we typically know that from that list and then we safeguard those students and we don't put them in anything so that's one piece not perfect but that's one piece nope. um, and the other part is um, right now with school pr professionals i think the the typical best practices is when we're talking about restricting access for a user on a social media platform the typical best practices don't ever do that unless you have legal cover Okay. So I think our process is probably, uh, we haven't had to do that yet since I've been here, but I would imagine that before we'd even entertain anything to that capacity, it's got to run through our legal process first. I think your no media contact thing is, is what I was thinking about. I just wasn't putting the two together. Last question. Um, we talked about the, the, the communications before with regards to school officials and students on social media and how that's going to take time to implement. I'm assuming we'll be voting on this policy next month. What is the timeline to implement this policy? Um, for this specific social media one, um, right now uh, we are starting to engage a group of what we call early adopters. We're gonna have 14 administrators or media integration specialists or coaches in the district for the next couple of weeks pilot Class Intercom with us. Now, Class Intercom is something that the district team has been using for years. We're very familiar with it. I'm actually a certified ambassador through that program, so I can train anybody on it if I need to, um, which is helpful in this case. But we're going to have a team of 14 that test drives the whole thing for a couple of weeks, and then we're going to roll it out to our administrators after that. I'm working on a different timeline for GISH activities. Again, as I mentioned before, Mrs. Wells, Mr. Ladwig, they're all in on this, but they know that it's going to be a big lift. Our goal is to have this stuff ready for them by the next school year. Okay. Perfect. Thank you both. Any other questions on that or any of the other policies? All right. Okay, now on to action items. <clears throat> Subject 6.1, GIPS Google Workspace plus multi-year agreement. Mr. Corey Gerhardt. I know I 
And you are not Corey. <laughs> Good evening. I know I represent Corey really well standing up here tonight, but he was unable to be here. So I am here just as a reminder of um, the purpose of this request was to enhance our Google Classroom LMS um, as we are trying to transition from Canvas back to Google. Uh, replaces Turnitin, which is really the process in which it um, reviews student work for plagiarism, and so it actually has a process that can do that for us. It replaces the security software that IT is already paying for, so we're kind of double dipping. Anyway, it is a cost savings of approximately 15% in two plus years. The cost is 40,000 annually with 2,000 onboarding and training with a one-time training charge. So we're just asking that you approve the funds for this tonight. And if you have questions, <laughs> I'll do my best. At this time, I would entertain a motion to accept the proposal to consolidate the third party apps. I make a motion to consolidate the third party apps uh, as presented. Second, Second by Ms. Halpers. Discussion? Seeing none, you may proceed to a vote. Motion passes. Thank you. Item 6.2, reducing specific staff positions, Dr. Kohler. Any questions over the resolution? Seeing none, I would accept a motion to accept the reduction in force resolution as presented. I make a motion to accept the reduction in force resolution as presented. Second by Ms. Halpers. Discussion? Seeing none, proceed to vote. Motion passes. Item 6.3, discuss, consider, take action on the addition of EL staff for GISH and 2-5 newcomers program at Stolly Park. Forward. So just see if you have any questions for Dr. Levas. Seeing none, I would entertain a motion. I make a motion to approve the addition of EL staff to be placed in positions as soon as possible at Gish and Stolly Park as presented. Second. Second by Mr. Garcia Mendez. Discussion. Seeing none, proceed to vote. Motion passes. Item 6.42111, Board Operating Principles. Mr. Fisher. Okay, this is a policy that we've spent quite a bit of time on, uh, going clear back to the uh, retreat that we had uh, last fall. Um, I think we've got everything kind of ironed out in terms of uh, chain of communications, uh, a number of uh, other changes that that were um, a part of this one uh, as far as listing how um, absences on committees uh, would be communicated to other board members to give them an opportunity to attend um, committee meetings uh, as far as monthly or as needed so that the the expectation was not there that it would be on a monthly basis if there was nothing to, to necessarily be done by the committee. Um, so I guess any questions about the things that are contained within that operating principles policy? Seeing none, I would entertain a motion. I make a motion to approve policy 2111, board operating principles as presented. Second. Second by Mr. Garcia Mendez. Discussion? Seeing none, proceed to a vote. 
Motion passes. Policy 2112, Board Member Code of Ethics. Um, there were no proposed changes to this policy, so this policy would simply be uh, approved as reviewed. I entertain a motion to approve. I make a motion to approve policy 2112, Board Member Code of Ethics, as presented. Second. Second by Mr. Garcia Mendez. Discussion? <clears throat> Seeing none, proceed to a vote. Motion passes. The last policy we have here is policy 2330, which deals with board member compensation for expenses. Um, there were a number of changes that uh, were included in this revision, but they all align with the practices that, that we've been utilizing. So there really isn't any, any change in terms of the operational side of things. There's some, some uh, name changing and, and uh, again, a little more spelling out of some of those practices. Entertain a motion. I make a motion to approve policy 2330, board member compensation for expenses as presented. Second by Ms. Albers. Discussion? Seeing none, we proceed to a vote. Motion passes. On to reports, item 7.1, student representative report. Hattie. The floor is yours. Um, okay, so I hope you guys had a great break, because I know I did. Um, but I'll start off with athletics. Uh, so boys wrestling, they had 13 state qualifiers and six uh, state medalists, and they were named the District A3 champions. Uh, for girls wrestling, um, they had uh, five state med medalists out of 12 state qualifiers, and they were named state runner-ups, and I think they only, they almost had the title, but I think it was like a couple points off. It was really close, though. But, um, yeah, that's what I was going to say. I thought it was like one or two, yeah. Um, and then junior Anaya Roberts, uh, in the weight class 155, she was named the first ever state champion for Gish Girls Wrestling. So that was really exciting. Um, cheer and Dance also had their uh, state. And um, Dance placed fourth in high kick. Then for boys basketball, um, they wrapped up their season with a win against Columbus, 54 to 51. And they also celebrated their senior night uh, for activities, uh, the robotics team, uh, 8151G qualified for state and they competed at the state robotics championships in Omaha. And then for the speech team, they had their districts on Tuesday at Lincoln Southwest and they placed fourth overall and had two state qualifiers. Um, senior Marissa Crosby was actually the district champion, and then sophomore Kyle Wigert qualified for state as well. And then some updates on the Superintendent Student Advisory Council. Um, last month, uh, Sherry Jones, who's a member of the Nebraska State Board of Education, joined our group and kind of shared with us her perspective on um, what we're trying to do with period poverty. And I don't think it was really anything that um, like us students expected because she wasn't um, very, Supportive. yeah. <laughs> um, but it gave us a chance to show us how passionate we were about the topic. Um, and she did suggest that, uh, that we consider it like being a district-wide, um, I guess, issue to tackle instead of rather a state-wide, but um, I feel like Gish, like that group, 
the student superintendent student advisory council we saw a problem that needed to be fixed and we did something about it so um like i'm hoping that like we're hoping that we can expand it to middle schools as well and that we can inspire other districts so i just wanted to give a little update on that and then we also talked about the phone policy um it's going pretty good i mean nothing has it might be different for me because i'm a senior but i mean nothing has happened in my classes where i mean i've never seen anything yet but yeah and then last month uh 35 juniors were inducted into the national honor society so they'll be taking over um the 90 from this year and then hall of honor uh it was unveiled on tuesday morning during a ceremony to celebrate the 2024 hall of honor inductees and those were george ayub class of 1968 dr thomas needle um, class of 1967, and Steve Hornaday, class of 1968. And then some upcoming events. Uh, the Charlie and the Chocolate Factory play will be this week at Gish in the Little Theater. Um, that'll be tomorrow at 7 p.m., Saturday at 7 p.m., and Sunday 2 to 5 p.m. And then prom is also next month, April 6th, at Riverside, and then post-prom is at Gish. And then this is also the first of many spring sport events. So um, I know soccer, they have their game today, their first um, game. And then baseball, they have uh, they had one today. And then track, we have our – there's a meet on um, this Saturday. But, the <clears throat> like, the first, like, actual varsity meet will be next Thursday. So, yeah, that's pretty much it. Thank you, Ms. Beltran. Superintendent report. Okay, um, just just to pick up a little bit on what Eddie talked about in terms of the, the superintendent group meeting with uh, Mrs. Jones. Um, yeah, I, it was really, I think, a, a very impressive meeting uh, in the fact that, as Eddie alluded to, the 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 perspective that that uh, Mrs. Jones brought was was very different than the where our students have been working from and uh, I think the students did a, a great job of, of sharing um, their you know their reasoning behind why they felt like this was an issue that they wanted to, to see addressed and and hopefully addressed on on a statewide level um, and they did it in a very, very respectful, very mature manner. And uh, so I think they, they really represented um, the school well from that standpoint. Got a really nice card from, from Mrs. Jones that uh, she had sent thanking them and exactly thanking them for that, for, for representing their viewpoint and listening to her viewpoint and, and having good discussion around that. So I think, uh, again, it was, it, it was a very, you know, maybe wasn't the meeting we, we would have expected necessarily, but uh, I think a very good meeting uh, overall. Um, at your place, each board member, I think, had an annual report. Um, we do have those done now. This is uh, the completed form. And they will be out in the mail in the next week or so, right, Mitch? And so, and, and we had those done both in, in English and Spanish. And so, um, again, a, a scaled down version of, of what we did last year, certainly, um, but still, I think, has all of the, the pertinent information and, and I think, uh, you know, has some. Uh, QR codes to point people to videos of, uh, you know, some of our graduates talking about uh, where they are now and, and how their educated, education benefited them. So I think, uh, I think it will serve our purpose as well. And it, it was a cost savings measure. Again, I think certainly we, we spent less on it this year than we had uh, last year for sure. Um, 
<clears throat> just a quick update on um, administration across the district. Um, this is all, I, I think, information that you've received through communications from from uh, Mitch. But, you know, Calvin Hubbard did move from his assistant principal position to be uh, the next executive principal uh, to replace Mr. Gilbertson at the end of this year. Um, we are still in the process of hiring uh, a replacement for him in that assistant principal role. Uh, Chris Ladwig moved from the assistant AD to the AD position that uh, Cindy Wells will be vacating when she retires. Um, and Ian Lemberg, who is a, a teacher and was the activities director at Walnut, uh, is going to move over to that assistant principal position at the high school. Cherie Stockwell, one of the assistant principals at Barr, is going to step into that principal role uh, that Mr. Eckerman is uh, stepping out of to, to be part of the MTSS team. We are still in the process of hiring a replacement for uh, Ms. Stockwell in that uh, assistant principal role. And then Jenny Ritter, who is currently the principal at Seedling Mile, is going to be stepping into the, the principal role at uh, Connectroom, where Opal Bentley is moving out to uh, also work in that MTSS um, instructional side of things and also do the assessment coordinating. So and so now we are also looking for a principal for Seedling Mile. So the uh, administrative musical chairs continues. Um, it, it's, it's been, I think, uh, really good to see the, the people from within who are, you know, developing and being able to step into some of those roles. So, um, overall, I think we're, we're in a good place from, from that administrative standpoint side. Um, otherwise, uh, administratively, or excuse me, legislatively, uh, just a few things going on. I did spend the day at, uh, uh, Greater Nebraska Superintendent's meeting today. Um, we actually had Senator Arch, the speaker, um, talk with us. And uh, I think from the school standpoint across the state, and certainly for us as well, um, Legislative Bill 1316 has created the most angst, maybe. Um, and that is the bill that would take uh, the revenue cap that was put in place last year from being a, a 3% cap with a board's ability to, to override that cap um, by a certain percentage to, to a point where that 3% cap would be a hard cap. And uh, I think for many districts, um, that would be a, a real hardship. Um, we had voted to have uh, some additional authority last year that, that potentially would help us to to make our way through a, a year or two but a three percent hard cap uh, in the economy that we're in right now would certainly be difficult for us within a couple of years so um senator arch um seemed to think that maybe that's not going anywhere um but you know we'll We'll see, and I, and I also sat in on the NASB legislative meeting um, the other day, and, and I think that was kind of the indication that Colby gave us too, is that 1316 is, ho you know, hopefully not going anywhere. I think leaving that ability for local boards to be able to to address the needs, I think, is, is very important. Um, beyond that, they talked a little bit about, you know, just not really knowing what the revenue package um, is going to look like at this point in time. You know, obviously the governor's plan includes a 1% sales tax and then spending down reserves from a number of uh, the different um, fund areas that the state has. Um, his intent is to create about a $1 billion um, revenue source that would allow for a 20% reduction uh, in property taxes. Um, the Revenue Committee hasn't advanced anything yet, so it's a little hard to tell what may or may not go uh, in terms of that. And then, you know, again, the 20% property tax reduction, there would have to be some vehicle that would say, here's now how we're going to get those dollars 
to schools primarily. It wouldn't be just schools, but schools are certainly the largest taxing entity. So there would have to be some kind of vehicle coming out of the education committee that would say, here's where those dollars are gonna go. And so I think with only a, a limited number of days left in this legislative session, it's, it's a little unsure whether anything will be done um, with that. So that's, after listening to multiple legislative reports from different people, that's kind of where I'm at is I, I don't know that anything's gonna happen. Um, but it, there again, you know, it could be one of those situations where there's, you know, bills that are shoved together at the end and, and uh, moved through um, like they were last year. So we'll see. Otherwise, um, the other speaker that we had uh, at our uh, meeting today was uh, UNL's interim president, and, and he had no real specific answers on why Trev Alberts is leaving. <laughs> so I got that out of the meeting today. So no, I was actually he had a you know really good uh, information about the the university system and some of the things they've got going on there and and it talked about you know their president search and 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 you know they talked about the same kind of things that we're dealing with in terms of you know finding faculty and finding uh, you know the funding sources that they need to be able to to recruit and retain people and. So a lot of the same struggles that we we experience at the K-12 level, they're also experiencing at the, the collegiate level. So that is the report I have. Any questions for Mr. Fisher? All right, seeing none. Move on to item number eight, executive session for the purpose of real estate because it is in the best interest of the public to discuss this matter in closed session. I would accept a motion at this time for the board to convene to executive session for the purpose of discussing real estate. I make a motion for the board to convene to executive session for the purpose of discussing real estate. Second by Mr. Holinsky. Discussion? Seeing none, proceed to a vote.
At this time, I would accept a motion to reconvene from executive session. I make a motion to reconvene from executive session. Second by Ms. Albers. All right, item number 10, approval of any action, which we have none. Oh, I'm sorry, that would help to vote, wouldn't it? Discussion? And the proceed to a vote. Thank you. Motion passes. Thank you. All right. Number 10, approval of any action deemed necessary as a result of executive session, which we have none. Item number 11, notification of upcoming meetings.